walking in intimacy with God. That's what the grace is about. There's nothing you and I could ever do to earn an intimate relationship with the Lord in our own works. But there is something that has been done, but we are to live that which has been done on the cross. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. We are called to work it out, not work for it. And the foundational readings that God has given me to share again, as I did Sunday, you might say, well, Pastor, I don't understand how this, this mixes in with the message, but we're also looking at the Feast of Trumpets. And I said that before. What I'm speaking about now parallels by the word of God to us spiritually, the Feast of Trumpets being blown come Friday after sunset uh, is the mixture of the chauffeur and the, then the feast day of trumpets itself is the two silver trumpets being blown as a prophetic voice, a word to the body of Christ, a word to the people of God, a warning, a sibling together to warn us about something. And I believe that they, these are what these two messages uh, for sure, <clears throat> the next several messages that come from the Lord leads me to is about a warning. It's about as we gather together to warn us, just like in Jeremiah 12, 5, it says that, that Jeremiah was, was complaining to the Lord about the challenges that he had in everyday life. And the Lord God said, if you get weary with the, the footman in the, in the time of peace, how are you going to deal with the swelling of the Jordan? That's right. And what he was talking about, greater challenges that are to come. These that Jeremiah was complaining about are everyday challenges. But with the Lord God said, if you're weary in those everyday challenges, how are you going to deal with the extraordinary challenges that are sure to come? That's primarily what he was saying. And this is what I'm led to, to talk about tonight is that we are to understand there is a work involved, but not for salvation, but a byproduct because of salvation. And that's the fruit of the Lord in our lives. And we need to understand that. And we need to embrace that as true, sovereign, absolute. Our foundational readings are Numbers 10, verses 1 through 10. Isaiah 58, 1. Revelation 1, 10. And I'll go a little bit slower next time around. But some of these I spoke about Sunday. Hosea chapter 8, verse 1. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 6. Let me check something real quick here. 1 Thessalonians, go there for me. 1 Thessalonians 4. Yes. Okay. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And you know what he's talking about? He's talking about the rapture, if you will, or the second coming of the Lord. What I want us to understand, we are in the feast of trumpets to cause us to look up our redemption is drawing nigh. And that means that we're to examine our hearts to see where we're missing it. I'll, I'll just be straight. Where we're missing it. And the reason why many of us are missing it is because we are allowing different things in our lives to trip us up and not deal with it. You see, everything in your life, in my life, has got to be dealt with. And sometimes over and over and over again. But what cannot happen is for us to allow these things just to stay put in our lives and we know what they produce. What I'm talking about is the trumpet is blowing the Feast of Trumpets is coming. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, causing me to speak to you in a warning way, not to condemn, but to get you to understand that one of these days, as Brother Brian was well saying, as one of these days, as Sister Love was saying, and all the other, all our promises are yes and amen in Christ. Brother Brian said we're not guaranteed tomorrow. We have the moment. Each and every one of us, Sister uh, Brooklyn says she's grateful, grateful for the counsel. Brother uh, Jonathan said he was grateful for this, this Adrian. But the point is this, what are we going to do with that gratitude? How are we going to look at it today? What are we going to do with these messages that God has given us today? These are not things for you just to write down. 
These are not things that just you to log in your notebook and to read it and forget about it. They're to incorporate into your life, just like the Feast of the Lord. Remind us every year. The trumpet is continuously blowing because that's the feast of the, the fall feasts have not been completed spiritually yet. All the other feasts have occur, occurred physically and spiritually. Passover, Pentecost, but your, your tabernacles, which is your last feast season, has not. And we are in preparation for that. I believe that's what the parable, if you will, of the five wise virgins are all about. And many others that align themselves up. When I talk about the trumpet blowing, I'm talking about not necessarily that you hear a spiritual or hear a, a trumpet blowing in the background. Some of you may, but through my voice, through what God's placed in my heart, you hear the trumpet. The word of God speaks concerning the season that we're in. These all speak, everything that I gave you, Numbers 10, 1 through 10. Isaiah 58, 1, Revelation 1, 10, Hosea 8, 1, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 6. All these speak about the reason for the sounding of the trumpets. They all warn something is coming. They all warn us that something is coming. And better yet, someone is coming. Now your text reading that God has given me to share with you is found in Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 16 and our text verses are verses 12 and 13. Again, our text reading is Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 16 and our text verse is verses is 12 and 13. Again, we are called to work it out, not work for it. In the name of Jesus, that hand is healed, Sister Love. There's no more numbness in it. Amen. I know, I've been speaking that over mine as well. Amen. Every one of us is challenged in different things, different seasons in our bodies and our minds. But I want you to know God is greater. I believe that more now than ever. And the greater, greatest time to declare that is when it doesn't seem like it. Amen. So whenever you see me doing that with my hand, speak it to me. Every time I see you doing it with your hand, I'm going to speak to you. You're healed and whole. Everything about you is wondrously and fearlessly designed. So the word of God says. Amen. And that's what we declare. All God's promises are yes and amen. Where? In Christ. He hung on that cross. He bore everything on his body for you and I. And because of that, we are healed and we are delivered in the name of Jesus. Amen. Brothers and sisters, as we come here tonight, I want us to continue to allow the word of God by the Holy Spirit to guide us into all the treasures of his holy word. Father God, I ask that each one of us hear and apply what we hear of God's word speaking to us tonight. Let it be our reign, the Lord God, to your, to your glory. Lord, let your word speak us, speak to us. Because brothers and sisters, what I want you to hear tonight above all else is this. Are you striving? Are you striving to be walking in the grace through faith? Are you striving to be truly lights in a dark world? Are you striving to be lights and be salt? Because you see, that's how we truly work out our salvation with fear and trouble. It's not about thus saith the Lord. It's about your life. It's about my life. You see, everything that was done on the cross was done on the cross, but you and I were not called to stand in the bleachers and look at that. In fact, your word, the word of God tells us that we're to take up our cross and follow after him. The word of God tells us that the work on the cross, that he says it is finished, and I know it's finished. The enemy is defeated. I know that the gift is free, but the journey is not. I know that there's a cost. There's a cost for you and a cost for me to continuously renew our minds, to continuously lift up our lives as sacrifices unto the Lord. 
You know, brothers and sisters, we all want to deal, and I understand that, with everyday issues. We, we want to make that the, the center of our lives. But truthfully, everybody, whether you be born again or not, has everyday issues. Those things are, God doesn't remove our everyday issues. He doesn't remove our striving. He doesn't remove the things that you have to deal with. What he does do is enable you and I to work out his victory on that cross in our everyday issues. <clears throat> he causes us to be above and not beneath, the head and not the tail. In other words, when the word of God says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, you are to prove God's word is alive in you. Yeah. And that's a struggle. That is a struggle. But it is what it's about. You can't add to the work of the cross, but you must become the work of the cross. You must become the work of the cross. When I say that, it means that your life must be hid in Christ so that you can be resurrected in Christ. Now, the word of God says in John 10, what is it? 10, 10, B, that Jesus says, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. Why? Because in John 10, 10, A, he says, the thief cometh but to steal, kill, and destroy. If he can steal your testimony, then he can kill your testimony, and he can destroy your testimony. Amen. So, brothers and sisters, when we look at our text, let's go to our text reading. I don't want to take more time than the Holy Spirit wants me to, but we're going to primarily stay in Philippians chapter 2, uh, and, and Philippians also chapter 1, but anyway, Philippians chapter 2, if you look at our reading, and starting with verse 5 of second uh, Philippians chapter 2, are y'all with me? Amen. The first thing it says is, let this mind be in you, which was also where? In Christ, in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. Now the key word there is servant. See, the mindset is that we become servants. Under who? Under God. The word of God says here, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he did what? He humbled himself. And that's what a servant does. We humble ourselves. Well, I don't like that word servant. We'll get used to it. Because when you serve the Lord, you serve him as a bond servant. Which means that you desire to stay in the house of the Lord. You desire to serve him. It's not that he makes you serve him, but you desire to. It's like Paul said, he said, I'm a bond servant. The word of God says here, it came obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also had highly exalted him. And given him a name which is above every name. That the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now look at our two text verses. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but how now, much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now the key to that is the first word that we read, that you must be a servant unto who? God. Where is the, where is the answer to being a servant? What, what, what is the benefits of being a servant to God, in other words? When you're a servant unto God, verse 13 happens. It says, for it is God which worketh in you. As long as you're not a servant unto God, as long as you're not serving God, God's not working in you. I don't care what you say. You can say, well, you know, I'm born again, but, you know, hey, listen, I'm not going to surrender. I'm not going to yield. I'm not going to allow God to have first uh, uh, place in my life. Well, then, and then you say, but I can't understand why God's not doing the work in me. Well, because, you, because you're not a servant unto God. Look at the next verse with me. It says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. 
That's what, a, that's what a, the master of a servant does. When God is our, our master, then we serve him and he works out those things in us because we belong to him. He works out those things in us. What does he work out? The life of salvation. The life of salvation. The life of salvation. Say that with me. The life of salvation is not something you talk about. It's something that we live. And God, he promised us in verse 1, excuse me, verse 6 of chapter 1 of Philippians. He said this. This is what Paul said. This is our confidence that he who started to work in us, he will complete that into the coming of Jesus Christ. And this is what God the Father does in our lives. When we surrender, when we submit, when we're humble before Him. But if you're not humble before God, you resist God, then how can you tell me that there's grace? How can you tell me that when you're not humble before God, that grace is, you're walking in grace? Is that line up with Scripture? No, doesn't it say in James, you don't have to go there, but it doesn't say that James, and James, that God resists the proud? But he gives more grace to the humble. So when people are, are, are wanting to, to live to themselves, wanting to do what they want to do, is that humbleness or is that pridefulness? That's pride. You think you're going to have grace when you want to live according to your own desires? Uh, no, you're going to be left to your own resources. And most of the time, that's very shallow. I can attest to that in my own life. And so can you. We know how it is to try to make things happen in our own strength. It doesn't. It won't happen. Word of God continues to say this. It says, it says, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things. Now this is your two, your two text verses. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things with what? Murmurings and disputings. So when we are actually saying that we're walking in salvation, but we're con continuously murmuring and complaining about what God asked us to do, when He's the one that's actually doing it in us, then that's rebellion, isn't it? How can we even ask our own congregation, our own brothers and sisters, to walk in relationship with God if we're not willing to walk in relationship with God. Why do we set the litmus test for that? Since is God, see, is God working in me something different than it works in you concerning salvation? Do I not have to de deal with uh, the sinfulness of my flesh? Do you not have to deal with the sinfulness of your flesh, your thoughts and your actions? But God said, I work in things in you. Did we not say uh, in, our, in one of our readings that God knows who belongs? He sets the, the, the godly man apart for himself. Sin not, be in awe. The, the word of God says, What is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure? Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Why? Why? That you may be what? Blameless and harmless. What does it mean to be harmless? Can anybody tell me what that means to be harmless? Actually, it means to be sincere. Not to lead somebody astray. Not to hurt somebody unintentionally. You know, this gets me, guys. God has given us salvation by grace through faith. And I've talked about it Sunday and many times before. So that it's not a work of our own. It's not, we do not boast in our own works, right? But then he says why he's actually given us grace. And I've said it over and over again. So that we can be, actually be his what? His workmanship. workmanship. His workmanship. Again, when you read this, it says salvation. He says work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why does he say fear? Can anybody tell me that? And trembling. Yeah, because it's a, it's a very serious thing that this walk that we have. It's a very dangerous thing that we have. It's not a walk through the tulips. 
It is very, why? Well, does not the word of God say, and what is it, First uh, Peter chapter 5, verse 8, that uh, Satan is as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may nibble at? Devour, thank you for correcting me. It was not nibble at, but it was devour. His intention is totally to destroy the people of God. To destroy, not nibble at, not coexist with you, but to destroy you and I. The word of God continues, and it says this, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. What is nation? Another word for nation. People, among whom you are just like they are. No, there's a contrast, right? A contrast as lights in the world. Well, how do you maintain that contrast? By working what? That's right. By working out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why? So that you're not conformed to the world. And how do we do that? By being a servant. And to be a servant, we always need to know what our master wants, right? And what is he, how do we know what he wants? Well, the word of God says in Romans 12, 1, 12, 2, to renew our minds and do be not conformed unto the world. But Romans 12, 1 says that we are to be living sacrifices unto God, right? So when we look at this, when we talk about working our own, working our own salvation out with fear and trembling, it's not talking, and you know this, it's not talking about earning salvation. It's talking about working out a life of salvation before all to see. And God says he works that in you to will it. Look, look what he says here. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and what? And to do of his good pleasure. Go to Romans for me. I just paraphrased it, but go anyway to Romans. Romans 12. I beseech you, verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present, what? Your bodies. Is, is the body, does it literally mean our bodies? Yeah, it literally means our bodies, right? And what else does that include? What else? That includes your soul, your mind, your thought. That's part of your body, right? And then it tells you how to do that. It says here, by the mercy of God that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy. Can you have corrupt thoughts and act on thinking that and still have a, a body that's acceptable unto God? No, you can't. Corrupt thoughts will come, but it's when you entertain those thoughts that it corrupts who you are. You're going to cast those thoughts down. You're going to bring those thoughts where? Not just underneath your, underneath your feet, but it says in, in 2 Corinthians 10, what, 5, it says this, to bring every thought unto or into captivity unto the obedience of Christ Jesus. Anything that acknowledges itself against the knowledge of God. And what is that? It's that you don't have to work out your salvation with fear and trouble. In other words, you don't have to live a life that is worked out to show what salvation really is. That's the lie of Satan. You see, we work it out, not through the works of the flesh, but the surrender of the flesh to the works of the Holy Spirit. Anybody understand what I'm talking about? Well, I don't have to take heed to that, right? You're saved by grace through faith, so you don't have to pay attention to what I'm saying, right? Do you hear the trumpet not blowing? Does not the word of God say, take heed lest you too fall? That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, right? And he's talking, he gave us a whole list of what the church in the wilderness fell to and why. And he said, these things were taught to you aforetime for your learning. And then he says, take heed lest you too fall. Our theme is this. God is committed to our growth in him. But are we? Philippians 1.6. God is committed to our growth in Him, but are we? 
The word of God that I was just reading in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I'm going to complete. So that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy means separated, right? Means separated. Acceptable unto God, which means holy unto God, being acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, which means is your minimal service. But then he tells you how this all truly comes about. You can't have an outward work without an inward work first. It says here, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Again, brothers and sisters, we are called to work it out, not work for it, but we work out something that has already been purchased for us. But let me ask you something, guys and gals. Does it do any good to come every chance you get to hear the word of God, write it down, take counsel from one another, hear counsel from the Holy Spirit, and not strive to apply that every day to your life? Does it do any good just to be a hearer of the word of God? So that's my question. If you're not going to do what the Word of God says, then why even bother hearing? Why even bother pretending? Because you see, he says this, if I'm not mistaken, and, and correct me, I don't mind being corrected, especially if you have a reason to correct me. The Word of God says that for it is God which worketh in you. Is that right? What does he do? Both to what? Will and to do of his good pleasure. So I ask you, is God committed to our growth in him? Is God committed? Did he not send his only begotten son? Did he not die so that we might receive salvation? Did he not, was he not buried so that we might have our lives hid in Christ Jesus? Spiritually speaking, through baptism, water baptism. But that, you know, that's a fact after a fact, right? Just like what I'm talking right now. We are called to work it out. That's a fact after a fact. Not work for it. We are, if you're redeemed, you don't work for your salvation. Your life is a byproduct of salvation. And it's an ongoing work. But the work that is done is not the labor of you. It's the surrender and the submission of you to the will of God. Amen. That's part of our text verse. It says it's God that worketh in you. Both to will and to do. So if God worketh in us to cause us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. It must mean that this journey that we're on is not to be taken lightly. It's, it's to be taken very cautiously and seriously. You young people, God will meet you right where you are, but he will meet you right where you are. You older people, he will meet you right where you are, but he will meet you right where you are. And he will not wink and say that you're young or that you're old. He will say, I'm doing the work in you. Why are you not walking and working out your salvation of life in me? Amen. I've given you all the grace that you need. And when you don't have enough grace, all you got to do is go to the throne of God boldly, not cowardly. And get all the help you need in time of trouble. You know when people are not helped? When, when they go to the throne of God and tell God their problems and leave and say, I still got the problem. You didn't work it out. God gave you what you needed to work it out. But you clung to the problem even when you left God's counsel. Blow the trumpet in Zion, Zion. Where's Zion? Type and shout of what? The church. The church. We used to sing a song a long time ago about that. That God's holy people. Brothers and sisters, that's what I'm talking about. We are called to work it out, not work for it. But that comes with submission and surrender. 
you and I cannot afford to be a called to be a contrast in the world, be salt and light, and look more to blend with the world than we do to contrast to the world. He says to prove it. Look, look let's continue with that Philippians. It says, do all things without murmuring and disputing that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke. Without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. How does that happen? The next verse explains itself. Holding forth the word of what? It means holding forth what God's word says. The word of life. I may rejoice that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. What he's saying is when you work out your salvation by surrendering and submitting to God, the word of God said that Jesus says you can't serve two masters. You'll hate to one and cling to the other. I've always believed that in order to serve God, you have to be able to serve one another. Can I prove that to you? Okay, go to Romans for me. Again. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. It says, let love be without dissimulation. Up here, that which is evil, cling to that which is good. Now, how can I say that in order to, to serve God, we must be able to serve one another? How can I say to work out our salvation that we must be able to, to serve one another before we can serve God? Because the word of God says to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. And the second commandment is as great as the first to love thy neighbor as thyself. You can't have one without the other. But you can't serve the other until you surrender to God. The word of God says here, be, be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love and honor and preferring one another. You think you can do that? Normally we do that for those whom we like. But we certainly don't do it for those who we have a grudge against, do we? Or somebody that we, we have a, a, a difference. I think you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Hey, it's easy to do. Man, I love to do it for Malachi. Oh, I prefer him above others. Well, I guess so. He's a baby. He can't speak for himself yet. He can't give you an opposition to your opinion, can he? God's never asking you for an opinion, guys. He doesn't want to hear about your opinion. He just wants to converse with you. Not his opinion, but his word. He says this, and this is what his word says, so I don't get carried away. Look how he touches every day, every, every day in our thing, in our living. He says, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. Now, how can we do that? Working out our salvation with what? Yes. Now who is working in us to will and to do? God. Does that include this? Oh, oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah, because see this is every day rubbing noses. This is every day when you rub elbows. This is every day when grace is not just a merit and favor. It's giving grace so that you can have grace when you live with someone or walk with someone. How many of you know that when we are here as a family, we live together? We are family. It means what affects you affects me. How can we walk in grace if the grace that we walk in, we put a fly in the ointment every time we turn around? It's not just about lasciviousness. It's about what I'm talking about right here. See, we can put a hedge row against certain sins, but everyday living, everyday attitudes, everyday getting along with one another, that, that's where you need a lot of grace, as far as I know, as far as I'm concerned. Look what it says. It says, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving what? The Lord. Well, let me back up. It says, not slothful in business, 
fervent in spirit, serving whom? The Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing, instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to the hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Whoa, 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 Pastor, you misreading that. No, I'm not. Do you think that this is working out your salvation with fear and trembling? This is where you leave tread marks. This is where you leave footprints. That's right, it's where the rubber meets the road. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, the word of God says. We are called to work it out, not work for it. You're not working for it by doing these things. This is what's being worked out of you in the life of salvation. This is what the Word of God meant in, in uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, where it says, He, God, wills you to do and causes you to do. What? Bless them which persecute you. Bless them and curse not. Do you know that a lot of times blessing someone that you're in a heated discussion with, let's put it that way, is not cursing them? In other words, keep your mouth shut. Let God deal with them. Amen. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Is that not what we also read in Philippians chapter 2? That we're to be of the same mind as Christ? Be a servant? Is that not true? Mind not high things. See, Jesus Christ didn't mind high things, did he? He knew where he came from. He was the Son of God. He was with God the Father. He was equal to God in that capacity. He was always with him, right? But he didn't mind those things, did he? I mean, he didn't say, look who I am. No, he took on the servant's attitude to show us something. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Who am I talking to tonight? The church. The church. Who is the church? That's right. We are. We are. If it be possible as much as lieth in you, live Peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is with, excuse me, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Go right over to chapter 13. Look at verse 8 for me. O oh, no man, anything but to love one another, for that lover another hath fulfilled the law. Matthew 22, 37 through 40. For this, and then the, the law, is what to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind, right? And to love thy neighbor as thyself. That's Matthew 22, 30, 37 through 40. And then it breaks it down. What does that look like, Brother Brian? It looks like this. Thou shalt not, what? Commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not, what? Steal. Thou shalt not, what? Bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. It says, love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And that knowing the time that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. We are called to work it out, not to work for it. Again, in Philippians, go back there for me, please. And I'm almost finished. Philippians 2. And I want you to look again with me hard at verse 13. And I want you to read it with me. Because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by what? 
All that I just read. Can you do everything that I just read in Romans 13 in your own strength? Is this working out your own salvation in everyday life? Yes, it is. Well, wait a minute, Pastor. I thought it was all these holy things. This is the holy. This is the contrast. Work out your salvation. You work out the life of salvation. Where does it start? In your own family, your own, with your own husband, your own wife, your own church family, your people that you work out. It's not them you're working out salvation to. It's your life in the midst of them. He says, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And what is that? First of all, do all things without murmuring and complaining. If you got to do anything concerning another brother or sister or concerning somebody else and complain the whole time, then you've done nothing. All you did is add garbage to something God was trying to work out of you. All you've done is when God has opened up a pathway for his salvation in your life to show itself as a contrast to the world or to those whom you are with, all you've done is made that that God is trying to work out in you not work out. If you have an infection in your body and you constantly keep it there, what is it going to end up doing? You're going to turn septic. Your whole body will turn septic. If you don't work out your salvation with fear and trembling, your whole life of salvation will be tainted. And guess what? The thing that I want you to hear more than anything else. The word of God that you read speaks to you and it says this, the trumpet is blowing. It's blowing. It's blowing. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. It's blowing. It's blowing right now. Wherever you are, however old you are, you've heard the word. The word speaks to you now. And it says, what is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure? Are you redeemed? Are you blood bought? Then work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's how serious it is. Because you see, what you don't deal with, Satan uses that as a playground. And you know what happens? He wears you off. Constantly battling with battles that shouldn't be a battle. Constantly allowing trivial things to become mountains instead of removing the pebble out of your shoe. Constantly allowing unfinished business to come back around and bite you. You don't ever sever the head off of a snake and then pick up the head and think that it's not going to bite you. Even though the head is not attached to the body, that's where the poison is. You don't pick up something that God's cast down. Amen. Church, tonight, what I'm talking about is I'm actually coming to that cold because I'm paraphrasing so much. What we need to understand is what should be happening in our lives because of who's doing the work in our lives. And that's our desire to work out that gift in our lives. That gift of God to us through the blood of Christ is to bring us into the newness of life. Into the newness of life. That's what John 10, 10, part, a, uh, part B is all about. Where he says, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. You have to work out your salvation. You have to work it out. We're called to work it out. Just not work for it. You know, what we do is we want to do things our own way. Then we repent and we try to do something that we have not received in our heart to do. We're still battling with our old hostility. You've got to lay that hostility down. You can't serve yourself and God. It's impossible. You're going to hate one and cling to the other. You can't work out your salvation if you're constantly wanting to promote your flesh. No matter what, brothers and sisters, the hostility is still there. It's in our flesh. That is the journey. That's why he says to work out your salvation with fear and judgment because the hostility is there. It's in our flesh. It's in our thinking. In the world and in our families. The gift is free but the journey cost us. Philippians 3, 13 through 19 says that Paul says we're getting the things that lie behind us and reaching forward to the things that are ahead of us. 
He's not only talking about our victories, he's talking about our failures. He's talking about the areas in our lives that we have not laid down. Because if you don't lay them down, they will take you to another area. And Paul talked about that. Let's go there quickly, and I won't read too many other scriptures because we're going to run out of time. But Philippians chapter 3, 13 through 19 says, Brethren, I count not myself as to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before. Why is it so important? So that you can press for the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Then the word of God says, let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. Again, it's very much in line with Philippians chapter 2, verses, I think it was uh, what we read, 6 through 11. It says, let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. Perfect means what? Complete or mature. Be thus minded, and if anything, be ye otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. In other words, if you're out of order, if you're disobedient, God will reveal this to you. How will He do it? He will chastise you. If you're not convicted, He will chastise you. He is committed to bringing His work in you to a place of completion. It says, Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together, be and mark them, which walk so as you have us for an example. Because watch what he says. If you don't, for many walk of whom I have told you often, and now I'll tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. For our conversation, our conduct, slash, is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 19 says, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. As I said, we'll work out our salvation with fear and trembling, but we don't work for it. Why? Because our hostility is our body, is our mind. The hostility of the world foremost is in our bodies, in our minds. It's not just the world. See, the world has to have a companion. And the only companion it can have is fallen flesh. So if that hostility is really pressing against you, it's the hostility of your own thoughts in your mind first. Deal with that and God will give you that perfect peace that only comes by Him. The victory of the cross has to be worked out in our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. But it has to be with our willingness to walk in the fruit of salvation by grace through faith. Those fruit are grown in us, but they are lived out in our lives for all to see. That's what Ephesians 2.10 is all about when it says that we are to be His workmanship. His workmanship. That's what Matthew 5, 13, 14 is all about. It's about truly being a light and to being the salt. That's why he warns us, if salt has lost its saltiness, what good there is for it. He says it's just good to be trampled underfoot. If you've lost the ability to walk as a contrast to the world, if you've lost the ability to be salt, which means to preserve or to keep from decay, then God said, what good is for you? You're good for nothing to be trodden underfoot. In other words, if our purpose is to be salt and light, and we're not operating in that, then how can we serve God? How can we be an explanation or an expression of our salvation being worked out? If we blend more than contrast, how can our salvation be seen? Church, as I close, Paul said, work out your salvation, your own salvation, or work out your salvation. I choose to use that word work as I close tonight, because so many people hate the word work, in a natural realm and also the spiritual realm. People just, man, I tell you what, you don't have to worry about leaving a shovel or a hole out for somebody to steal, because they're not going to steal you know why? Because that involves labor. 
Now you leave a zero turn with a key out there full of gas, I guarantee you, they'll take it. You leave a car out there open, they'll take it. But you leave a hole and a shovel out there, Sister Vicky, they ain't gonna take that. My grandmother never, man, she never locked away her tools. You know why? Because she always knew that nobody would want to do what she does with that hole and that shovel. Every morning at 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning, she had her bonnet on and long sleeves, and that hole that started out about that wide was about that wide now. Because she honed it, she made it sharp, so that in her labor, all she had to do was barely tap the ground, pull up that grass. But it took labor to get her to that point, is what I'm trying to say. I use work out your salvation because that's what Paul used for a reason. Not to work for your salvation, but work out a life of salvation in the midst of a perverted and a dark world. And believe me, this is a, this is a great time to work out your salvation before a perverted world. It's never been darker as long as I've been alive. But it, because of the darkness, that's when the light shines the brightest. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to commit to what God has committed to? As our theme suggests, God has committed to our growth in Him, but are we? That is up to you. It's up to me. There are several things that you need to understand, and I will close with these, and I'll make them quick. We are to work at making sure that our hope is grounded in Christ and His Word applied. John 15, 4 through 6, Galatians 2, 20. We are to work at making sure that our hope is truly grounded in Christ and His Word applied. John 15, 4 through 6, and Galatians 2, 20. We are to work at keeping our minds and our lives renewed in God's Word that has given us to help us grow. We already talked about that, Romans 1 and 2. We are to work to make a break from sin. Hear what I'm saying? We need to work at making a break from sin. What do you mean, Pastor? I, I, I'm cleansed from all my sin, but you're still walking, living in sin. So you need to break from that. Is that not what Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 talks about? It says to lay down every heavy weight and besetting sin. We're to run that race. We're greatly encompassed by a great cloud of witnesses that said the same thing. So yes, we are to work to make a break with sin. We're not just to sit back passively and think that it's a done thing. We are to break away from it with true repentance. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. We are to work at applying the positive work of God, the work of the Bible in our lives. In other words, we are to work at love, which we read in Romans 13, verses 9 through 21, and Romans... Um, was it? Romans 12, 9 through 21, and Romans 13, verses 8 to 13, I believe it was. Don't hold me accountable for that, but it's close to that. We are to work at applying positive behavior, behaviors of love and compassion and kindness and generosity, faithfulness, endurance, and those things that apply to the fruit of the Spirit. Again, like I said, Brother O.B., it's Romans 12, 9 through 21. And Romans 13, verses 8 through 11. You are to set boundaries. You are to set boundaries. We are to work at guarding against the influence of the world. In other words, set boundaries of our worldly friendships. If you don't, then you're tainted. You become more like them, and I know that for a fact. You start thinking more like them than they do like you. Why? Because it revives your old nature. You come from that fallen nature. So it doesn't take much to revive that fallen nature. So we are to guard against the influence of the world and set boundaries with our worldly friendships and amusements. And be careful how we use our time. 1 Corinthians 15.33 and 1 John 2, 15 through 17. I close with this, and I thank you for your additional time tonight, guys. 
My dear people, I thank you for giving me the time to share this last thing with you. Working out our salvation means that we're to bring our salvation to a practical expression in our lives. We are to live our salvation. We are to live focused and determined to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, we are to be an expression of God's work on that cross. I'm not talking about just dying to sin. But I'm talking about our lives being hid in Him. And I'm talking about living a life of being salt and light. So that people know that there is a work being done in us that has produced a fruit of a new life. Father God, I thank you, Lord God, that your word is true. I thank you, Lord God, that Father, no matter what, the enemy, the devil, is prowling around looking to devour your people. But Lord, you've given us everything we've needed. You told us to put on a whole armor to fight against the wiles of the devil, against the devil's schemes, and against the rulers, and against authorities and powers of this dark world. Lord, I know that Father God, victory as a believer is there. But if it's not walked in, Lord God, then it's not experienced. Lord, we can't just watch it from the stands. We must actively be involved and working out our salvation, working out a life of salvation that was purchased for us, Lord. And Lord, I, I close with this, because everything that I'm talking about, brothers and sisters, again, I think can be parallel to something that Ezekiel said, that he experienced when he saw the Lord, that he had a vision, I call it, in what it is called is an open vision, and this is what that open vision looked like in Isaiah, excuse me, in Ezekiel 47. It says this, there was water that came down from the throne of God. It speaks about the presence of God. It says in verse 3, and when the man that had the line in his hand went forth east when he measured out a thousand cubits, and he brought me through the waters, the waters were to the ankle. Again, I want you to hear something. The man brought Ezekiel himself to the waters. He brought ankle deep. And then he measured out again. And it says that the waters, he brought them to the knees. And then he released some more water, Sister Vicki, which is the presence of God. You can't go to, you can't climb on a ladder by jumping on the top step. It's got to be progressive. We work out our salvation with fear and trembling. The gift is there. The, the work has been done on the cross. But is your life representing that? Is my life representing that? Especially when it says that God works in us to will and to do. So if the willing and the doing is not there, then where is our servitude? Where is our surrender? It says again, he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters to the loins, to my waist. All these speak to the fact that even when you go into the water, you go into the waters in some beach, ankles, you can, when, when the water gets kind of rough, you can run out, right? When you're in the knees, when the water gets kind of rough, you can kind of run out too, right? When it gets to the loins, you can still run out, although slower. God doesn't want us to end up where we can still run back to the world. He wants, wants us fully committed, totally surrendered, so that we can be in that place where Ezekiel saw, he saw a river that he could not pass over, or the waters were risen. Waters that were meant to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. God gave us the gift of salvation to work out in fear and trembling. A life of abundance, a life of holiness, a life 
of being light and salt, a light of being a people that can make a difference. But we got to swim in it. We can't just visit it. Father God, I thank you for your word tonight, Lord. I thank you, Father God, that, Lord, your word is speaking to us tonight as a trumpet, warning us, Lord God, drawing us to come closer. As that song says, to go all the way. Lord, help us to go all the way with you. Help us to commit to living a life of salvation that was so graciously graced to us through the blood of your son and the work of the cross. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Everybody says, Amen. Amen. Would you give God all the glory?